uh, today's speaker is Padma Sundara. Uh, she's going to talk to us about uh, EEG and MEG, and uh, she has been working with this for more than six years. Uh, she's really an expert in all aspects of EEG and MEG, so if you have any questions, uh, she's the person to go to. And yeah, so I'll let you start. All right. So, um, so this talk will mostly be um, about um, kind of underlying um, some of the models, like neuronal models underlying EEG and MEG signals. So when I when I actually started as a postdoc, I I was doing EEG fMRI, and uh, at some point, it was the first time I had uh, actually measured any sort of electric potentials or fields, and I I, I that's what that was kind of how I got introduced to electrophysiology and um, I, I was at some point trying to figure out how strong currents were in the brain and and it it, it seemed to be like a very simple question but I it was the answer was not at all that straightforward because the only people who report currents in the brain are people in MEG and they often used units that like I'm an electrical engineer and I it, they did not make too much sense to me because these were biophysics units. Uh, so, so some of the um, so in the talk, I, I I tried to clarify partly to myself, but also hopefully to anyone who is interested in some of the origins of these fields and um, how kind of uh, how to think about this sort of data uh, when you step away from the big software packages that allow you to to analyze your data and try to really understand what you are measuring. Uh, hopefully this will build some intuition. So that's sort of uh, the way I organized it. So um, I, I went digging a little bit uh, to look at the um, early history of EEG and MEG. So I start with EEG because the electric, um, the electric measurements in the brain predate the magnetic measurements uh, for obvious reasons, one being that the Magnetic measurements require much more sophisticated sensors, and those were not developed till the 60s. And so, the electric measurements had been going on for a while, uh, you know, starting with the late 1700s. And if you if you look at this uh, figure here, that's actually from um, Galvani's original uh, manuscript that he published. And uh, one of the things he was interested in showing was what the relationship between electricity and movement was in terms of now we would think about it as like a muscle nerve relationship but back then it was just thought of phrased as animal electricity and and in this one basically what he has here is he has a lightning rod attached to the wall and it's attached by a wire to the leg of a dead frog um, and so there's two wires there, the, and the other one is also a lightning rod, and it's attached by a wire to something called a Leiden jar, but it's basically what now we might call a capacitor. And so he waits and waits in his garden for a storm to appear. And then finally, when the lightning strikes, the, the leg of the frog twitches. And this sort of is like a stimulation and, and recording experiment. And so subsequently people, started stimulating invasively. So they would have exposed brain and various animals. And the big one uh, finding was um, Hitzig and Frisch. Uh, they stimulated the cortex uh, in a dog and found that the contralateral uh, muscles moved. And then, uh, but there was no sort of topographical mapping. So subsequently, David Ferrier came and he sort of topographically mapped motor function in various animals. But all these initial uh, works were still this kind of model that you stimulate and then there's an electrical response. So it's not really recording of spontaneous activity. And there was not any progress until um, Richard Catton did invasive recordings of uh, brain activity uh, and using a galvanometer and he was able to detect uh, electrical signals in like monkeys and rabbit cortex. And so this is still invasive, but the first non-invasive uh, human EEG was done by Hans Berger, who was a neurologist. And that, um, that, uh, those are kind of the waveforms he recorded. And 
He actually did the very first alpha rhythm that he recorded was on his teenage son. And uh, he also subsequently recorded like these, these are, sorry, these are spike and waves in an epilepsy patient. And he tried to share these uh, data with the sort of the German scientific world and nobody took him very seriously. Um, and so he got demoralized and sat on the results for nine years at the end of which he published 14 papers with the same title uh, because he had done so many experiments by then. Um, but after, after, after him, um, Edgar Adrian, who was sort of a superstar of the neurophysiology world, who at that point had already won a Nobel Prize, uh, got interested in, in um, Hansberger's uh, findings and so tried to reproduce them. And so he, he was able to do, um, you know, eyes open, eyes closed, alpha rhythms. And uh, one of the things in the, or in the, in Berger's findings, he sort of misinterpreted a bit that he wasn't sure what the alpha waves were. And so he thought it was some sort of uh, fundamental rhythm that appeared from the entire brain. Uh, but uh, Adrian basically was able to localize the alpha rhythm of the occipital lobe, which now seems it's like bread and butter stuff for people to do EG, but uh, at the time it was not obvious. And he, in his paper, he, they report that these rhythms are linked uh, to, you know, the opening and closing of your eyes. So that's kind of the, uh, at this point, we're kind of at no, uh, looking at non-invasive EG in, in humans. Um, so the, actually the first sort of evoke potentials um, were actually auditory responses and they were recorded here uh, in Boston. Um, and you'll see they have these kind of triphasic uh, shapes, uh, but you have to note that these are single trial data because there was no computer averaging, no ERPs. And so uh, people did very, very careful measurements so that they could actually report these single trial data. And once this initial uh, finding appeared, there was a huge excitement, people trying to find different uh, cognitive evoked responses and uh, figuring out exactly what latencies they had with respect to the stimulus that was presented. And so you'll often see in, um, when EEG data are reported, they will kind of say that they were looking for a N100 or P300. And it usually it means that there's a negativity, so it's N and then the, and it's followed by the latency with respect to the stimulus. So it's a very standard way to uh, report ERP um, components in cognitive uh, neuroscience. Uh, so I, so I, until the 60s, there was no averaging of ERPs until this paper from 1962. And you can see how they, they're so proud that they averaged their trials, that they plotted every single data point. Um, uh, you know, because it was averaged by computer, which they say in the, I believe they say in the letter. So that's sort of the background of EEG. Now, MEG has uh, an interesting history uh, sort of rooted here. In the, so in the mid 60s, David Cohen uh, started constructing um, a five layer magnetically shielded room uh, at MIT. And you can see this looks really space age and there's a model, down, there used to be a model downstairs. Um, and the first signal they detected was actually the, um, the signal from the heart, which is much stronger. And then they recorded alpha rhythms. But if you look at the initial paper, you will notice that the, there, were no, there were no sensitive uh, magnetic field recording instruments like we have now. So it was basically a, a copper induction coil. And um, the MEG measurements uh, were phase locked uh, to the EEG measurements. And there were about 9,000 uh, averages to make the, the first alpha wave uh, waveform with MEG. But um, subsequently, uh, the first squid uh, detectors were made and, uh, by Jim Zimmerman. And, um, one, and these really made magnetic fields that improved the sensitivity of uh, detection of magnetic fields. And so uh, David Cohen and Jim Zimmerman then uh, recorded uh, alpha waves. Uh, and this is that one. And um, there used to be, David Cohen's notebook used to be downstairs um, and where he has, where he shows, sort of annotates the uh, eyes closed, eyes open. So at this point, 
the point, the goal is to just have MEG do exactly what EEG had been doing for a long time. So it's just a different way to look at the same, almost the same waveform. All right, so that's sort of just like the big background. Um, I, I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, I wanted to talk about current dipoles, but before I, wanted to, before I get to dipoles, I want to just define some terms. Uh, so here, for example, so here is a, a neuron. This is a neuron. And uh, it's getting an input at, at a synapse here. So this is the presynaptic portion. And this whole, everything that is after the synapse is the postsynaptic portion. So you can think of it as an input. This, this is an input location. Um, now the, the inputs at the, at the, in this uh, presynaptic area are, they tend to be fast um, action potentials. They're, they are very stereotypical. They always have the same amplitude and the same timing. Now, when the action potential arrives here, uh, there's some neurotransmitters are released and this will open up some junctions in the membrane of this neuron. And uh, in response to that action potential, this neuron will generate a very slow uh, postsynaptic potential. So what I showed you is it's positive, so it's an excitatory one and it could go ne swing negative, in, in which case it will be inhibitory. And so people in electrophysiology will often label it EPSPs and IPSPs. Um, so so I, I want to explain what, how the dipole arises from that basic model. So <clears throat> here, I, uh, this is just from, a, a, this is a, my annotation of a figure from a EEG textbook, but here is, uh, so here's the synapse, okay? And the, the, the thing to know is that, um, Nothing is happening right now. The cell is at rest. If you, if you put an electrode right inside the cell, uh, then you would measure minus 70 millivolts with respect to ground, which you can assume is the extracellular space. Uh, now, I'm gonna imagine that, so this is my EEG detector, and the EEG basically is gonna measure uh, voltage across the resistance of this extracellular space. And so it's not det detecting anything. Here's my little MEG uh, detector and it's not, nothing's happening yet. Now, um, now let's say the synapse is active. I, I, the, the illustration here is for an excitation. So what the excitatory um, synapse does is that it makes the inside of the cell slightly less negative in a very small area, wherever the synapse is. So all these negative charges are now gone and so there's a slightly less, less, slightly less localized negativity inside. Now, now the event is, is done. Now what happens is that now you have uh, basically um, a potential gradient along the membrane. And to sort of um, drive all of this back to equilibrium, there will be currents that will flow from the area of higher um, potential to the area of lower potential. And so inside the cell, the current's going down and outside the cell, the current is going the other way. Um, it's, it be, uh, a lot of textbooks often talk about anions and cations and uh, because the, the ion, uh, there's different types of ions that, that contribute to current flow, but this, but it's just better to think about it like an electrical engineer that currents flow from higher potential to lower potential. And so you basically have uh, this sort of, this is the direction in which the current is moving. Um, and, and also that there is nothing actually going across the membrane. So the, the cell is a capacitor. And so you, 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 there's not really a current going through, but there's actually charges moving uh, on either side of the walls of this capacitor. Uh, so now, uh, so now I just want to define current source and current sink. So if you were an observer, the observer is always in the extracellular space and you are looking at the cell. If you are looking at the cell and it looks like the current is coming towards you, it's a current source. But if you are looking at the cell and the current is going away from you, then it's a current sink. So here you have a current sink and you have a current source. Um, and so, 
So, so that gives you basically this figure, which is often figure one in all MEG, EG textbooks, which is uh, a current dipole. And so you have um, and a cur the current going from the current source to the current sink. Uh, and the, the current dipoles all, always have units of amp nano amp meters. So, it's, so you can think of it as a charge separated by the distance. And the, the spatial um, unit is important because uh, you can tie it to the dimensions of the neurons or to the dimension of um, whichever cell is, is generating this uh, current dipole. Uh, but this idea of the current dipole is really fundamental to recording um, electric and magnetic activity with EG and MEG. Uh, note that the current dipole is not a ma it's not the same as a magnetic dipole. Magnetic dipoles are like a small current loop. So this is a current dipole, and it's it's a it has a very specific definition. Uh, I want to see one more thing. Um, yeah. So uh, just uh, I, yeah, I, I wanted to talk about two things on the slide. Um, so there's all these different currents. So uh, we are, the, this entire uh, universe of current flow is operating in a quasi-static regime, so there is no accumulation of charge. And so all, all the currents have to sum up to zero. And, uh, but you don't actually get magnetic fields and electric fields from all of them. Uh, even though you could, in the process of completing all the loops, see lots of different paths. Uh, so for example, the action potentials that arrive here in this input uh, presynaptic area, uh, they actually are like two, they're like a moving front of two dipoles, uh, which are oriented opposite to each other. And so it's, it's a quadrupole and the field from that, uh, not, it not only decays very fast in time, but it also decays rapidly in space and it goes as one over R cubed. Uh, so the, it's very hard to see the quadrupolar uh, magnetic field. But with a dipole, uh, the which is uh, generated by this slower current, the EPSP or the IPSP current, uh, it goes as one over R square. Uh, the other um, thing to note here is that um, the, the action potentials always have the same uh, they always they always have the same amplitude and the same sort of ta uh, temporal properties. They always have the, they always about a millisecond uh, long, uh, and so it's an all or nothing uh, event. Uh, but this subsequent uh, post synaptic event, which happens here, it's graded, and so uh, every time an action potential arrives at this synapse. Uh, the cell will put the cell will have a small excitatory post synaptic response uh, now before the before the um, before this slow response goes back to baseline if another action potential arrives it will just add on top of whatever was already there and so at some point uh, if there's a rapid train of action potentials arriving here then all these graded responses will basically just sum and you will exceed a threshold and it's usually about 40 minus 40 millivolts or 50 millivolts and so if if the inside of the cell uh becomes instead of minus 70 millivolts it's minus 50 millivolts then the cell the, this cell also has an output so you know let's say like here and then you will have a bunch of action potentials out being output from the cell but that's, um, so that's the basic idea. But in MEG uh, and EEG, mostly we are dealing with these EPSPs and IPSPs. You have a question? Uh, so you have the quadruple here because from here you have action potentials being plotted. No, if you were just trying to look at that specific, uh, so it's just these, sorry, it's just this one, this guy and this guy, those. No, it, they move together. Oh. Yeah, that's that's the way that that's how that action potential travels along the axon. Uh, it's not like it's not like the entire nerve is depolarized. It's just a very small segment, and it's a moving front. It just moves like this, and it has very specific conduction velocities. So you can um, you can sort of put electrodes at different locations and measure the speed. Uh, based on the nerve, um, based on the uh, diameter of the axon, you will be able to figure out the speed. Uh, 
Uh, because it's too, uh, no, it's because it's two dipoles. It's two dipoles that are opposed to each other. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They're anti-symmetric. Yeah, they, they just move like this together. So you can... Uh, so I guess I, I didn't understand based on your previous explanation why this was I think you have to write out the uh, basic, uh, you'll have to go back to uh, Maxwell's equations. I see. Um, I see. If you write out the, uh, if you write out just like Bio Savart's law for uh, the dipole, you will, you will see the one over R square um, thing. And so if you had uh, two dipoles. But why do you have two dipoles? You have, uh, you have, no, you have two dipoles because it's, no, so it's because of this. So. So you see here how you have a little bit, you have a current sink and a current source. Just imagine if you had another current source and another current sink. So just point it the other way. But that's just the model of reaction potential. That's how it is. That is, that is how it moves. Uh, you can find movies online that will show you this, basically this charge that it's just, uh, it's basically just a wave front. Oh, I see and it just moves at a very specific speed. So little, little patches, lit, uh, especially if the, if, the, um, if the axon has no myelin at all, let's say it is not covered uh, with anything, then uh, the whole, it will just be this kind of front that moves. Yeah. Uh, so, right, so, um, so we are mostly measuring population activity and so, uh, this this is uh, you remember the right hand rule for um, currents and magnetic fields. Um, so uh, right. So when we talk about uh, primary currents uh, in EG and MEG, we are basically referring to this sort of. It's like a it's a mostly a macroscopic definition um, of current in the tissue and oriented a certain way and. Um, so uh, it turns out that uh, MEG uh, cannot uh, detect um, radially oriented dipoles. Uh, EEG does see them, uh, but MEG, or, so MEG only sees tangential ones and uh, EEG, EEG sort of sees everything. EEG sees radial, it sees tangential, uh, ME, MEG sees only these. So, oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, so here's some numbers. Um, so EEGs are usually uh, in the 0.1 to 100 microvolts. Maybe in epilepsy, you might get 200, 300 microvolts. Um, the MEG signals tend to range in the uh, femtotesla to picotesla range. So just to compare, um, Earth's magnetic field is in the microtesla range, and the fridge, fridge magnets are milliteslas. Uh, MRI scanners are just tesla units. Um, so when we talk about current density uh, in, in the biophysical world, uh, we are always talking about current dipole moment density. Uh, and uh, so that, and it turns out that the current density in, in brain tissue is constant uh, across uh, species, across brain regions, uh, and it, the nut number is one. So it's one nanoamp meter per millimeter square. And uh, it's, the numbers from this paper by uh, Murakami and Okara Neuroimage, uh, where they have a huge amount of experimental uh, evidence and some um, arguments for why they were why they found this number to be the case. Um, uh, so it turns out the dipole moment for uh, measurable cortical uh, generators in humans is about ten nanoamp meters. So you can. Um, and, and you can also compute um, for a single neuron, pyramidal neuron in the cortex, what the uh, current dipole moment would be. And that turns out to be 0 0.2 picoamp meters. And so if you take the big Q and the little Q, you can kind of back uh, estimate that about 50,000 uh, synchronously firing cortical neurons um, are needed to generate uh, detectable MEG signal. So that's kind of the, does anyone have any questions? 
might knock you look pencil. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the 50,000, so this number means that I mean, there might be some cancellation, right? So yeah, yeah, yes. So I mean, assuming, uh, assuming, um, assuming uh, not accounting for topology and, and cancellation effects. Uh, if you just had a flat thing, yes. But I mean, it's probably more than that. All right. So, uh, yeah, this, so this is, this is just like what everything looks like. So this is, uh, you know, the old school <laughs> EGs, uh, which looked a little bit sci-fi, but then uh, we have now modern EG caps, and uh, this is very much what a page of EG recordings would look like. Um, now, MEG uh, measures uh, magnetic fields with very sophisticated uh, sensors, and these are called SQUIDs, and it stands for uh, Superconducting uh, Quantum Interference Clearance devices. Um, now the squid-based MEG sensors need to be shielded, cooled, and tuned. Um, and so here at Martino Center, uh, we have two shielded rooms in the MEG um, in the MEG lab, and then we have one shielded room uh, next to the 4.7T area. Um, and uh, all of them are uh, multi-layer. Uh, well, one of them is a single-layer room, but the other is a multi. Other two are multi-layer rooms, and they're all made of mu metal, which is very expensive um, alloy, I believe, of nickel and um, I don't know if it's cadmium. I think it's nickel and cadmium. Um, the, the, the sort of uh, noise in, in the squid sensors uh, here in our Neuromag system is about 2.5 femtotesla per square root hertz. Uh, now this, so, you know, you can do EEG anywhere, uh, but MEG is an, is an expensive enterprise because of because of all these reasons. Um, now, uh, magnetic fields, uh, the magnetic fields we want to detect in MEG originate from the neuronal currents, but you also can get magnetic fields from putting magnetic materials uh, inside the shielded room, and we want to keep those off of the subjects and uh, outside of the shielded room. So I, I just want, I, um, I want to just explain just the basic MEG measurement. Uh, when, I, when I started doing MEG, uh, I didn't know all the details, and so I tried to just read the manual and operate the acquisition software. And if you, if you log into the MEG scanner, the very first thing you do is, is you open up and just look at just empty room waveforms, and it's just noise, sensor noise, essentially. And until your sensor noise comes down to 2.5 femtotesla per root hertz, you're going to fiddle with the system. You're not ready yet. Um, one of the things, one of the options in, in the software is, is a way to reset the electronics and uh, tune specific problem sensors. And uh, one of the things you do is you heat the sensor. And it never seemed obvious to me why, why, why you had to heat the sensor to reset it. And so I was kind of trying to, this is more for my own understanding because I just did not seem obvious to me. So this is basically the setup. So, uh, you have a pickup coil, and, uh, and, and this is what they call the input coil. The pickup coil is the part that's closer to your head. Um, since, the so it, since the magnetic fields are so small in MEG, you have to amplify the field with a flux transformer. And this whole thing is made of superconducting metal. Uh, now, let's say this is your neuronal magnetic field. Uh, the whole thing is submerged in liquid helium. Uh, now there's no, there are no, there's no resistance. This we are in a zero resistance uh, regime now, and so to compensate for that field, you have this much more concentrated field in in the pickup coil, um, and that field is what is detected by the squid. So there's no, you are measuring an in MEG we are measuring absolute signals, unlike EEG where we often have uh, a reference electrode on the scalp and then you measure uh, a potential difference between two points. Uh, this measures an absolute magnetic field. Um, now sometimes, uh, sometimes you leave the door of the shielded room open or uh, a subject brings uh, has something magnetic on them, and then what happens is that. Uh, the squid gets what is called a flux trap. So it's trapped magnetic flux. And um, it's a MEG jarg. It's a MEG jargon, but they say that, oh, there's a flux trap. And so now you need to 
transiently heat the sensor just above the critical superconducting uh, temperature by applying a heater pulse. And that's what happens when you say heat sensor. So you heat the sensor and it sort of um, removes all the, any flux that's being stored in this uh, squared coil in your flux transformer and then, then it cools it back down again. And when it comes back down, uh, the noise in the, is just standard thermal noise uh, of the right um, amplitude. So uh, there's two, so there's, uh, in our system here, we have two types of um, magnetom, uh, we have two types of uh, MEG sensors. We have magnetometers and we have uh, spatial gradiometers. Um, so the magnetometer uh, is, is very simple, fairly primitive, just a sing, like single loop of coil. Um, and it, it, it is sensitive to, um, well, everything. So it, uh, you know, it, it will pick up noise, it picks up distance sources, it picks up superficial sources, a bit of everything. Uh, now, if, so, so if you, so let's say you put this magnetometer, I have this current dipole here and I put the magnetometer here. Uh, it's, you know, it's very sensitive. Uh, then I'm right in the middle, uh, the flux through the coil cancels, so I don't get anything. And then I'm at the other edge and, you know, I'm, I have the opposite polarity. And so uh, this is what the sensitivity profile would look like. Um, in a planar gradiometer, uh, you basically have two um, coils that are uh, bound together in opposing sense. And so, uh, this this one uh, is much more resilient to distant noise sources. So, for example, if you had a distant source of noise um, that was sent, these are the flux lines that were going to the coil. They were all just cancel out. Um, now, if I as I'm if I'm on this edge of the dipole, uh, one of the coils is is uh, it's aligned uh, favorably, and the other one not so much, and so you end up with this sort of uh, sensitivity profile and it's very uh, sharp uh, spatially with respect to the dipole, but also because of the way that the planar radiometer is wound, it is very sensitive to superficial sources and not so much uh, to deeper sources. Yes, yeah, uh, with, with respect to what? Uh, um, no, I don't think so. It's not less sensitivity. It's more uh, that it uh, you won't pick up anything d deeper than uh, the up topmost layer of the cortex. Uh, we don't have this type of gradiometer, but I think they are in some of the older MEG systems, and it's an axial uh, gradiometer. Um, and it, you know, it basically has two, uh, they just, the coils are stacked and they are uh, bound uh, in opposing sense. Let me just move forward a bit. Uh, so our system here has um, 204 uh, planar gradiometers and 102 uh, magnetometers. Uh, so it's a 306 uh, channel system. Um, so this is a slide. Uh, from one of Mati's talks. Uh, so, so as I had said before, MEG only sees tangential sources. Uh, so the, the it, MEG uh, signals, if you just plot them on the scalp, they have always the same stereotypical uh, scalp map uh, because they don't see any sources oriented in any other direction. But EEG scalp maps tend to be quite a, a messy affair because you can see tangential sources and radial ones and tilted ones. And so it's uh, less clean uh, to read just off of the scalp map uh, compared to MEG. Um, EEG, of course, is sensitive to uh, conductivity. So, you know, the EEG signal has to basically go from the brain through uh, CSF to bone to skin and then finally to the electrode. And so when it traverses through these, um, the bone, especially being a poor conductor of electricity, the, the electric field is, is smeared. Uh, the magnetic field, of course, is, does not... Um, is not affected by these um, conductivity boundaries. So uh, in EEG, you will see an effect um, of, you know, whether there was a skull or 
skin that was poorly conducting, but um, MEG is unchanged. Uh, so I just want to I, I just want to give like a this is more like a bird's eye view of of uh, how uh, the, the minimum norm source estimation is done from EG and MEG. Uh, this is sort of the the bulk of the inverse solutions, uh, which basically means we measured the EEG and MEG outside um, the head, and now we want to reconstruct uh, from these measurements uh, current source estimates inside uh, the brain. And so um, I just want to show how, how this is formulated. So uh, this is basically like a, so it's like a Y equals to AX plus B uh, type solution, uh, type problem, and so you have um, M, so M here is your MEG or EEG data. So it's it's a matrix of, uh, so in our case, let's say 306 sensors, and then however long, how many ever time points are in your recording. So if you look at a single column of this data, you can plot the scalp map. Uh, if you look at a single row, it's basically that sensor that versus time. Um, now, if you look at the G matrix, uh, it's called the gain matrix, um, and it's often referred to as a lead field matrix. Uh, this one is <clears throat> basically uh, the matrix of the number of sensors um, times the number of potential sources. And so one of the things you have to do when you solve uh, for the inverse solution is that you have to make an assumption on, on what sort of source distribution you have, and so uh, you might make a very dense source distribution or a very sparse one, and then try to figure out, uh, reconstruct the best possible estimate of the time behavior of these sources for the data that you have. Uh, now, if you look at a single uh, column from this gain matrix, it's basically uh, tells you for this one potential dipole, what the scalp map would look like at all the sensors. Um, now X is, is are unknown. That's what we want to find out. We want to know what what is the amplitude at the sources at we at all these different source locations. What is the amplitude uh, of the activity that generated that um, EEG or MEG signal? Uh, so if you again, if you look at the X matrix for a given a single time, then you can see. The, that's your solution and you can play it like a movie. And if you uh, look at it in, uh, for a single source, then you can see how that source is behaving over time. And it's usually like a nano amp meter uh, units uh, versus time. Uh, and that's our additive noise, ease additive noise. Uh, so the, in the minimum norm solution, uh, you basically what you do is you set up a source space and you can have a surface source or a volume source. And so you have a grid of dipoles and you can choose the density of the dipoles on, or you can choose how to populate this grid. And um, note that this is an underdetermined problem because you have more sources than you have measurements uh, usually. And so you need to find an optimal uh, solution given the data. Uh, so the, the MNE method, which was developed by uh, Mati Hamlinen uh, finds the current distribution uh, that has the smallest overall amplitude that can explain these measurements, and it's in a L2 norm sense. So that's kind of how the um, solution works out, and it's a close actually works out to be a closed form solution that can be computed quite fast. Um, I just oh, I was going to talk about the MNE software, but I'll I'll move on. Um, it'll I'll get to it in a second. Uh, so this is uh, this is just um, uh, just like a, a big picture view of what the acquisition looks like. We often do MEG concurrent MEG EEG acquisitions here uh, in the MEG lab, and so the the patient often uh, the subject will wear a cap, um, and we we triangulate the locations of these EEG electrodes before they are scanned, uh, and we also record the locations of some landmarks like the nation Indian. Then the person is uh, seated inside the shielded room, and uh, then we play some, there's a task or some sort of activities measured and then observe it, uh, and then you process the data. Uh, so that's sort of the big picture of the MEG acquisition. Um, so 
Now the processing pipeline will abstractly looks like this. So you have uh, the subject's um, structural MRI scan, um, and you have the subject's MEG and or EEG scan, and you also have a recording of the. Usually we do an empty room recording so we can estimate the noise, and then uh, all of this data goes into a long processing pipeline, and then you emerge out with an estimate of the activity on plotted usually on a, a free surfer type uh, brain and that varies with time. So that's the, in a nutshell, what is it looks like. Um, so you, you know, the, some of the, the software packages, we use free surfer, uh, MNE Python, and uh, there's, um, there's still, uh, MNE C is still used and, uh, there's some other um, softwares, rival softwares that I uh, will not highlight. But um, <laughs> and I just thought I should mention them if you if you want to look it up. So anyway, so um, so to, so you know we usually get the MR MR uh, structural scan and then uh, run free surfer to get uh, all these different uh, surfaces, um, and then. Uh, so you, you need to provide to the inverse solution method, you need to give it uh, a description of the source, uh, where you think the sources should be, so that it can give them amplitudes and time courses. And so you need to make, uh, get all these uh, different layers uh, of the brain. Uh, you need to uh, get the, surf the boundary element model, uh, mesh surfaces. Um, know that this this is not this has nothing to do with the MEG or the head position. This is just this is all still we are just basically processing the structural MR scan, um, and you need this to compute the forward do the forward computation. Uh, so then uh, we co-register co the uh, MRI head to the head position that was recorded during the MEG. Uh, so it, it turns out that there are. Uh, several things that get registered uh, during this process. So the, uh, when we, we have a, pos a record of the subject's uh, head coordinates when the person is sitting outside the MEG because we recorded these landmarks. But then when they go into the MEG, um, the, the, we have head position coils that will help register the uh, gantry of the MEG to the subject's head. Uh, and then all of these will need to be registered to the subject's structural scan, which was done in a totally different session. And so uh, this, you can, you, there's many different ways to do this registration, but um, they, they will all ultimately give you, uh, they write out this coordinate transform matrix, uh, which you will need to provide at different time points to the software. Um, <clears throat> So this was the so that's a surface source space for example uh, at a certain um, density and so wherever there are yellow um, dots um, there are uh, little dipole vectors um, you can also of course use a volume source space um, let's see now so uh, once you've got the um, once you've got the source space, you can make the forward solution, uh, the forward solution, and uh, and then you can get the noise covariance matrix from either empty room or if you did uh, like an event-related uh, type of uh, experiment, you can probably use the baseline period of the data to get your noise covariance matrix. Uh, you should pay attention to uh, whether the the noise covariance matrix is unstable because if you use um, a, a poorly behaved noise covariance matrix, you could induce weird correlations between your source estimates. And so uh, the uh, MNE software, which is super well documented, has lots of examples on how to regularize your noise covariance matrix and what your, um, there's a whole universe of options there. <clears throat> um, so then you, uh, once you get this inverse operator, you can apply to your MEG EEG data and uh, you can get a source estimate. And you know, these are sort of the standard figures that are seen in the MEG papers for so, uh, surface source estimates. And if you did a volume source, then you will get your estimate of your source activities in volume space. And so that's sort of what it might look like. Um, I just want to 
spend just a, a nanosecond on artifacts. Uh, there's also lots of different types of artifacts, um, eye blinks, uh, eye movements, uh, just like saccade movements. Um, any sort of muscle tensions uh, will, can generate this sort of buzzy kind of uh, artifacts. Respiration uh, can give you these slow rolling artifacts. And then of course you see cardiac uh, related activities as well. Um, you can remove it. There's, there's a bunch of different artifact removal methods. Um, you can use a method called signal space projection. Um, there's uh, independent ICA, which will also, uh, ICA can be used, um, I, I use it often to remove cardiac um, artifacts, uh, but uh, note that ICA assumes that the sources are statistically independent and that's the only assumption it makes. Um, I just want to see one more thing, okay. Um, so, so this is just a, a snapshot of all the different types of things you can, you could look at your data in time, uh, you know, you can epoch your data, look at time courses. Uh, of course, when you estimate your data, you can look at that source activity, uh, like nano amp meters as a function of time. Uh, of course, then you can look at your uh, data as a function of space. So you can just plot all the time courses as a function of space. You can plot your source estimates uh, in, in, on the surface or in a volume. You can uh, look in the sensor space by making these uh, scalp maps, um, you can make, uh, of course, you can also look at uh, time frequency. Uh, you can look at the frequency content of your data as a function of time. Uh, you can look at the frequency content as a function of space. Uh, and, and you can combine uh, these uh, different ways of looking at things and you can look at coherence. People are doing connectivity analysis. Uh, you can do Granger causality by combining space time as well. Um, so there's many different ways to look at the data. Um, I just want to summarize. Uh, so, uh, so just to summarize, EEG detects electric fields due to neuronal activity. Uh, MEG detects the magnetic fields. Uh, note that they are sensitive to differently oriented sources. Um, you will run into the neuromagnetic inverse problem, which is to estimate the current source density uh, underlying this measured data. Uh, you should remember the number one. It is uh, approximately the current density in cortex across all animals and all disease and all health states. And it's one nanoamp meter per millimeter squared. So if you're ever looking for a number to punch, that's a good estimate. Uh, even if you know the magnetic or electric uh, field everywhere outside the head, you can't recover the primary current distribution uniquely. Uh, so one of the, uh, there is the, the big ambiguity in the solution of this inverse problem is that the results depend crucially on whatever assumptions you made when you set up the source model. Uh, so the, there is an ambiguity in the size in the spatial extent of this source, uh, even if the, even if the, um, because you could have put a single dipole or even a distributed dipole at that location, both of which would have generated the same um, scalp map. Uh, and that is partly related to the limitations of our um, method. So I will end with a Mati quote, which is that, uh, different source estimation methods will give converging evidence if you interpret them correctly. So uh, I think that's the end. <laughs>